Hi! Welcome to part two of my video on the ladies of Steubenville, Ohio and their petition against the forcible removal of the Indians in the Indian Removal Act of 1830. So today in this video we're going to read over the actual petition and interpret what it's saying because some of the language can be a bit difficult or confusing. So, Memorial of the Ladies of Steubenville, Ohio against the forcible removal of the Indians without the limits of the United States. February 15th, 1830, Red ordered that it lie upon the table. To the Honorable the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States, the Memorial of the undersigned residents of the state of Ohio and town of Steubenville, respectively sheweth, that's kind of like saying here is what they're trying to show. That your memorialists are deeply impressed with the belief that the present crisis in the affairs of the Indian nations calls loudly on all who could feel for the woes of humanity. So in the last video, I talked a little bit about chunking and I'm going to demonstrate it more here. So what they're saying is anyone who has ever felt the woes of humanity, the troubles that come with being alive, should raise their voices and speak against the present crisis because they should have empathy. They should know how hard it is just to survive. And so they should call out in support of the people who are suffering. To solicit with earnestness your honorable body to bestow on this subject, involving as it does, the prosperity and happiness of more than 50,000 of our fellow Christians the immediate consideration demanded by its interesting nature and pressing importance. So they're saying that we are asking you to give the opportunity for prosperity and happiness to these people. And it is of the utmost importance that you heed our uh, request. It is readily acknowledged that the wise and venerating founders of our country's free institutions have committed the powers of government to those whom nature and reason declare the best fitted to exercise them. So they're saying we acknowledge that our founding fathers um, decided to give the power of government to the people who it belongs to. And your memorialists would sincerely deprecate any presumptuous interference presumptuous interference on the part of their own sex with the ordinary political affairs of the country as wholly unbecoming the character of the American females. So they're saying, look, we know we're women. We know we're not supposed to get involved in politics because it's against our character as women. We understand this. Even in private life, we may not presume to direct the general conduct or control the acts of those who stand in the near and guardian relations of husbands and brothers. So here they're saying even in our own private lives, we don't try to convince our husbands and brothers to vote or act in certain ways because it's not our duty. Yet all admit that there are times when duty and affection call on us to advise and persuade, as well as to cheer or console. So it's saying as our positions as women, there are times when it's important that we do advise others, we give them advice, and we try to persuade them. And we also cheer them up and we console them if they need comfort. And if we approach the public representatives of our husbands and brothers, only in the humble character of suppliants in the cause of mercy and humanity, may we not hope that even the small voice of female sympathy will be heard. So here they're saying, even though we're usually disregarded in politics, if we consider the public representatives to be like our husbands or our brothers, we're being very humble, we're asking for mercy and humanity, and please listen to the small voice of female sympathy. So they're saying, even though we're women, even though we don't have any position in politics, please listen to us. Compared with the estimate placed on women and the attention paid to her on other nations, the generous and defined deference showed by all ranks and classes of men in this country to our sex forms a striking contrast. So it's saying in other countries, the attention paid to women is 
in contrast with how women are seen in the United States. And as an honorable and distinguishing trait in the American character has often excited the admiration of intelligent foreigners. So it's saying that other countries respect what it means to be an American. They respect the American character. Nor is this general kindness lightly regarded or coldly appreciated, but with warm feelings of affection and pride and hearts swelling with gratitude, the mothers and daughters of America bear testimony to the generous nature of their countrymen. So here she's trying to sort of, or here they're trying to sort of um, compliment the people listening because they want them to know, like, listen, we understand that we're treated better than people in other countries and Americans are respected for this and it's not something we take lightheartedly. It's something we take with a lot of pride and affection. We're very grateful that of how we're treated. And we know that the men in our country are very generous and we could say for sure that this is the case. When therefore injury and oppression threaten to crush a hapless people within our borders, we, the feeblest of the feeble, appeal with confidence to those who should be representatives of national virtues as they are the depositaries of national powers and implore them to succor the weak and fortunate. So they're saying, even though we are in this position of submission, we feel that it is essential to speak up about what's going on. So here I'm going to take a note. So even though the women have said that they have no political power, they find it necessary to speak out in support of the hapless people, especially because um, violating our treaties and their personhood is against our national virtues and that we should care for the weak and fortunate. So you see, I'm putting it in my own words, but whenever I use phrases that I took from here, I'm putting it in quotation marks to indicate that I didn't come up with that phrasing. I took it directly from the source. In despite of the undoubted national right which the Indians have to the land of their forefathers, and in the face of solemn treaties, pledging their faith of the nation for their secure possession of those lands. So here they're saying the Native Americans have their own undoubted national right. They have the right to the land where they've lived for generations. And they've made solemn treaties with us, pledging a faith to us. They're saying, we trust you that you're going to let us keep our lands. So here, the ladies emphasize that the Native American tribes have entered treaties because they trust that we will uphold them, protecting their rights to their lands where they've lived for generations. It is intended, we are told, to force them from their native soil to compel them to seek homes in a distant and dreary wilderness. So they're going someplace, they don't know what it's like. They don't know if it's going to be dreary. They don't know anything about it. They just know that it's unfamiliar. To you then, as the constitutional protectors of the Indians within our territory, and as the pe peculiar guardians of our national character and our country's welfare, so here, she's, they're emphasizing that they're supposed to be the guardians of the people who live here, including the Indians, or the Native Americans as we call them now. Um, so the government is supposed to protect the people within the lands, including the tribal people as well as the character 
of the nation. Basically, we want to keep this idea of the United States as a place that does things fairly. That's part of our character. We solemnly and honestly appeal to save this remnant of a much injured people from annihilation, to shield our country from the curses denounced on the cruel and ungrateful, and to shelter the American character from lasting dishonor. So here, they have some great points. They know that the Native Americans have already endured a lot of injuries, and not just injuries like physical injuries, but injuries against them as a people from the United States. Oh, injuries. They know that um, doing this is going to cause annihilation. Or destruction, ruin. And um, they want to shield the country from the curses. So they believe that if we do this cruel thing, if we do this cruel, ungrateful thing, we're going to be cursed. And we want to protect the American character from being dishonored. So this is basically what they were saying. And then, and your petitioners will ever pray. That's just them saying, we're going to pray that you please take our word and um, go from there and please do not pass this law. So that's all for looking over the petition of the ladies of Steubenville. In our next video, I will go over our second reading. Thanks for watching, and I hope this has been helpful for you.